with me today, I've got a very esteemed, confident, and very, I mean, how do I say this, very game-changing panel uh, to talk about and build on the concepts of carbon credit and credibility. Uh, and you're going to hear about all the stuff they're doing in this space that is really driving quality of quality credits and really helping us decarbonize and meet the goals we need to. But before we jump into them, my name's Shrinand, you can call me Shri, call me whatever you want, just not abusive. I'm the head of sustainability advisory at BDO USA, um, the long career in uh, advisory across the big four, went and built solar farms up and down the East Coast. So I understand carbon credits uh, in a really weird way, but um, have worked in decarbonization my entire life, basically. So. Great to be here with you, um, but I'm not the show. These guys are. So without further ado, Brendan, I'd love you to kick us off by telling us a bit about yourself, your company, and how you impact decarbonisation. Sure. Great to meet you, by the way. Yeah, you too, bro. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brendan Hermelin. I'm the CEO and founder of a uh, company called Thalo Labs. We're actually based here in uh, New York. We're over in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. Uh, my background actually is coming at this from aerospace defense. I spent a lot of time um, making cool systems that would measure greenhouse gases from space and from airborne campaigns and all sorts of stuff, which is actually super depressing because you can't do anything from space. So you send an email, still leaking, right? Um, uh, Thalo, our, the fundamental of what we're doing at Thalo is, is to try to accelerate um, the drawdown of greenhouse gases, particularly here in the built environment. And very core to this is that we actually kind of know what to do because we've been doing it on power plants and in cars and in high grade aerospace applications where we can make sure that you're never leaking and you're constantly operating both combustion and refrigerant based assets at the highest possible quality. Um, we just have never been able to do that for like the built environment. In fact, the built environment is effectively unregulated. We have no idea what's coming out of our exhaust pipes here. Um, so we are advantaging some really cool new uh, technologies to be able to bring that down in scale and cost uh, such that you can now deploy it anywhere, it's cheap enough, where suddenly the conversation can be not just um, a compliance mechanism where you have to, but it can actually save you money. So you're doing a bad job in your emissions, probably wasting a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, so that's how we're trying to impact. We've actually already touched almost 80,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent here in, in the New York City area. Yeah. We've only been operating for a couple of years. And we're pretty excited to, to use scale that. Love the reality of tying carbon performance to economic performance. It's a challenge we face in the marketplace all the time. Amen. We're not going to go systematically. We're going to change this up because it's the last one. We'll go to the end. Chaps, hit me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. So Chams, I'm the head of carbon finance at uh, Declimate. Uh, Declimate is a call it global decentralized climate data marketplace. Uh, so we're big in data, uh, and we are leveraging this to create an ecosystem in the carbon credit space. So we've built different applications um, around uh, the, the VCM space. We have a digital MRV solution called Cyclops. Um, that's uh, pre-mapped 400 million hectares uh, of forest globally, 20 plus countries uh, covered, uh, and historical data that go back 30 years. Um, on top of that, we are also building a carbon registry um, in order to trace uh, credits and projects uh, that Cyclops is actually covering. Um, and we're offering this also to countries in order for them to uh, comply with the so-called uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement um, and avoid double counting. Um, on top of that, we believe that um, we need to have tangible impacts. Um, so we are also developing our own projects. Um, so we have a forest preservation initiative in the DRC, where the goal is to protect several hundred thousand uh, hectares of uh, forest at risk of deforestation in the Congo Basin using Cyclops as the monitoring, reporting, and uh, verifying solution, and the registry in order to uh, to sell the credits uh, that will be generated. And just to conclude, uh, since we're building an ecosystem, and we touched on, on that a little earlier, the climate was incubated by a company called Arbol that does parametric insurance in the ag and re renewable space. Um, so we're now uh, integrating parametric solution for uh, carbon projects. Wonderful. So you're using the power of tech to really drive backable data and assurable data for nature-based solutions. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff. Let's go back to the engineering side. Um, we've already had Brendan. Let's go to Martin. 
Oh, well, surprise. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Martin Decker. Uh, so I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Zero Six. And what we're doing is uh, providing a methodology and the PMRV. We're actually shutting in oil and gas wells. Because what I always thought was very interesting, I mean, I used to work for a big oil and gas company. And when I left these guys and say, well, you're doing wonderful things building renewable energy. You're going to transform, decarbonize these sectors. But what are you going to do with upstream? No <laughs> answer, no strategy. And if there's an energy transition, it's a transition from one into the other. And markets work very well if you address both the demand and the supply side. And what we started, but there needs to be a solution how you actually get oil companies to stop producing oil and gas. And what we are doing, we're providing a mechanism to shut in the least efficient wells, or as they are, the most polluting wells. So shut us in first, that reduces methane now, that's reducing the most polluting wells now. So it's going to have a huge impact now. And it gets us excellent out of oil and gas and actually providing a mechanism to incentivize producers to do it using carbon markets. So plugging methane leaks everywhere. Yeah. Plugging, plugging wells and methane leaks all over the US. There's a joke there somewhere. I'm just not going to say it. Oh. <laughs> Alec, go on. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Shree. Good to be here. Uh, I'm the CEO and co founder of Climate Sense. Um, I don't know where Darren is, but I've spent the last 20 years in the nonprofit space, which uh, I think you hate. No, no, no. no it's really important, uh, you know, sort of part of the uh, the economy, right? Sort of the third sector. Um, spent uh, 20 years uh, trying to solve some really intractable problems around uh, financial inclusion through micro lending and micro insurance. I forget what the insurance guy was. Um, uh, health system and su systems in Sub Saharan Africa. And over the last um, eight years um, at the Rainforest Alliance and at the World Resources Institute. Um, which brought me to uh, this moment here, you know, with um, our co-founder, Alex Morgan, who is also at the Rainforest Alliance. What I've heard today is that a lot of the issues are around sort of, you know, data verification, uh, auditability assurance. That's what Rainforest Alliance did. and did for, you know, 40 years and still does. Um, we, uh, as leaders there on the executive team, I think found that it was fairly frustrating to not have the technology uh, at the time, uh, and that's you know how Climate Sense was born, right? So we worked with farmers uh, throughout the world to uh, essentially help them farm uh, better, more regenerative, regeneratively. Sorry, it's a hard word to say, but ultimately putting sensors in the ground uh, using spectroscopy to pull that data, putting it on chain, yep. uh, making it verifiable and audible. It does feel like Friday, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, very acceptable. Stephen, do you want to take us back to the engineered carbon credit side? Absolutely. I'm, I'm Stephen Atkins. I'm CEO and founder of Conversions. We help clean technology companies access carbon credit markets. So when I talk to, I've been investing and helping clean tech companies raise money for 20 years. And when I ask them about carbon credits, they either say, I don't know. Do I really have the possibility to get access to that? Or it's going to cost a lot of money and I have no guarantee I'm actually going to get them. And so our business model is we do it on a success only basis. We don't charge them anything up front. We take a share of the carbon credits at the back. Uh, and that, in my view, is the best way to help new clean technologies get to market and, and, and accelerate their adoption. And we'll dive into that after we're done with all the introductions, because I really want to ask each and every single one of you what your barriers to entry are for your particular product right now. Uh, but before we do that, we've got Doug. Last but not least, mate, I trust in you. <laughs> Doug Cornell, uh, I work for a company called Farmer's Edge and uh, have, a long, have a long career in agriculture, uh, government, into the private sector, some startups, uh, tech space. So I've done quite a bit, and so I've got a pretty pretty broad window of dealing with uh, dealing with what the carbon credit market. And uh, so Farmers Edge has got has done a whole bunch of credits, and we're we're busy marketing them. That's why we're working with uh, with uh, Triangle here, and Darren's been very helpful on that front. Um, but. I just want to back up a bit and give you a little baseline because we're talking about uh, about the carbon world on on how we got there. So Farmers Edge is is sort of known as a precision ag firm or a tech or a ag tech firm, 
And uh, it started, it got started with uh, just a couple of uh, agronomists figuring out now that uh, or when GPS technology showed up in farm machinery, you then knew where you were on the field. And so now you could vary your fertilizer. And so they worked and worked at solving, solving that equation. And it's not, it was in those days, it wasn't an easy equation to solve. So it took some tech, it took some cabling, it took satellite imagery, it took soil testing. And so they built that into a company. And in, in about uh, early uh, teens, 2012, 2013, they realized that they were on their second or third platform already, that they needed to go big data. They need to go, you know, go after this in a big way. So they raised venture capital and turned built over several years, several more years, what we think is the most complete ag platform, data platform for what we call, and we, we steal in ag now, we steal a oil and gas terminology, the upstream portion of this. So from that first processing plant back upstream uh, with the grower to get all that data. And so what, what, we, what we built over that time is something that, that starts with, with the crop planning, goes through helping manage the crop, um, satellite imagery, uh, soil testing, doing the recs, agronomists on staff, kind of the whole schmear uh, from there to harvest and then hooks to do the traceability at the end. So this platform is built, it's functioning. And because when they hired me, because we have that platform, I was drawn to the company. They hired me to build a carbon credit program. And because we have that platform, we're working with growers in Western Canada. I had 75% of the data I needed. The fields were bordered, the, the locations, like a, the product supply, the passes by machinery for you know guys doing no-till or not doing no-till. All those pieces were in place and we just had to finish that. And so this goes to the, the sort of carbon credit piece. So we use that technology to, to do credits in the, the regulated space in Alberta. Alberta regulated regulated greenhouse gases in 2002. In 2007 or 8, they, they went to, to uh, allow the carbon, uh, carbon credits or carbon offsets to offset the, the large final emitter sort of charges uh, if they didn't reduce their emissions enough. So we did that there for about 66,000 tons on a no-till on a no-till um, uh, carbon protocol, and then we moved that into into the rest of Western Canada. And the, the Saskatchewan and Manitoba farmers were quite hungry to get at some of that some of that funding. And it's not very much per acre, but we did uh, we did 660,000 tons on that no-till protocol. Um, uh, we did four vintage years. And then we uh, then we um, uh, did another one on nitrogen management, and we believe it's the first. We did fifty thousand tons uh, on a on a nitrogen management project, and our advisors tell us it's the first field scale nitrogen management project. And that goes all the way back to that beginning I started with of a couple of agronomists figuring out how to do variable rate n, and then turn that into a four hour program that advises growers on how to grow crops better and reduce their uh, reduce their emissions um, and, and improve their economics all at once. And so that's that's the base that we started with. And then the key portions of that, I think that that uh, that I wanted to mention on the integrity side and working with with uh, some of the comments around assurance is that, you know, QC and QA. So you just you, you got to have control. You got to do things the same all the time. You got to hire independent third party and verifiers, which really are auditors, but they're verifiers because they understand carbon markets. And um, if you're lucky, they understand agriculture. And uh, that's been really helpful for us. And then, then you create those assets and put them on a registry. And that takes us to, to where Darren is, is. What do we do to get some more velocity on these registries? I'll stop there. No, that's good, Doug. Thanks. Um, that won't be the last time we mentioned assurability and the nice boring side of things. But let's jump into the real commercial viability side of this, because that's what we're all here for. If we don't put a commercial lens on carbon credits and the production of them, then we don't have this platform and environment where we can actually hyperdrive decarbonisation through nature-based and engineering-based uh, engineered carbon credits. So the question I've got for all of you, you're all creating, you're all minting credits through phenomenally different 
yet impactful ways. When you're going into the marketplace and trying to sell those, A, who are your buyers? What pushback are you getting? And how do you handle that pushback? And I'm not going to point at anyone, just have at it, one of you. <laughs> I can comment on our buyers to date. Um, they, they run the gamut of, of, of you know, large CPGs, food companies, to oil and gas, to furniture manufacturers, to, you know, it, 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 it's, it's we, we have our most success with people in the food business because they understand where they came from. And really, we've now had people starting to look at our credits and sort of say, well, they're just like the insets we do because it represents grain production in, in a pool of where they where they draw grain for the processing. Martin, I think it's I think it's something that's relevant to you because of the methane plugging, so to speak. Um you know, what type, do, you, do you get any specific pushback when you go to sell these credits in the marketplace? Well, when we started introducing our credits, I mean, this was like last year. So everyone knows the carbon market was horrible last year. I mean, thanks to The Guardian, I mean, they pointed out some really good things. And uh, But to Monica's point, the naysayers, it doesn't help. Uh, so it was a very hard time introducing a new product. And also introducing what I guess all of them in the panel are doing here is adding the transparency, the auditability, the data behind it. That's what we're all doing. That was new as well because the registry is not giving you that. I mean, good luck finding any of their data. Yep. So if you're doing two new things, that's kind of hard. So the usual players look, well, actually, just give me cook stoves because I know them. <laughs> give me cook stoves. Whereas new products, which actually help and actually actually help decarbonize and get the emissions down, weren't getting the attraction. I mean, I'm not, I'm not having anything at uh, cook stoves. So what we're seeing now, and that's where our buyers are coming from, is asset managers and getting into institutionals who just say, well, carbon is a problem. So how do I hedge against that? Do I buy carbon products as insurance? Do I want to give my customers, my clients, exposure to carbon as an asset class? Yes. And now it's going all about transparency, quality, and very important quantity because Darren talks about velocity. I mean, I'm learning that word, but it, it's about you need to have quality and quantity. And there was a whole conundrum in the carbon markets when I was at Shell. I mean, it's like, oh, you can't have, you can't have both. Well, that's stupid. If you can't have both, then don't play in that market because for a market to mature, you need to have both, you know, quality and quantity. And so I think that's what uh, I'm seeing what's interesting in our products because, gosh, there's a lot of wells to be kept. There's a lot of methane to take out of the air. So if you want to have running room and have impact now, it's a great product. Yeah. You know, I, I like I like this question because we're talking about carbon credits and uh, we actually have not really sold any carbon credits yet. All of our customers to date have been people who actually want to decarbonize their buildings. We put stuff in the buildings. We can literally reduce the emissions coming out of them. These are, in some ways, better for companies to be able to finance it. Um, a lot of those customers are banks. And all the sort of first product we've been trying to make has been around doing the same stuff we're doing in the Fortune 500 companies in, for example, low middle income buildings. Like we have NYCHA housing here in New York. They have 500,000 people breathing some pretty awful air from fuel combustion, right? Leaking refrigerants, leak all, all sorts of nasty So why wouldn't we do that? The, the two things that I have I've found, and I feel like they're very, um, they're very related, is there's a zero to one problem on financing because a lot of these banks are very excited to finance good terms. Some of the terms are Swiss cheese, including some of the ones that were recently released by people who shall not be named. Um, but when there's Swiss cheese, they're unfinanceable. And they also don't want to finance anything that's uh, under you know 100 million bucks. So I, I said, well, OK, I'll prove it. And they said, it takes me $2 million to write the contract. So unless it's 100 million, I'm not going like, to even do this. right? So that's zero to one activation energy. I think it's really hard and a challenge for new type of programs. And the other problem with new types of programs is they really can't figure out how to be comfortable with risk. Yep. Because the risk isn't just that, you know, the MRV doesn't work. I'm very comfortable in our MRV. We make sensors for this, like it definitely works. Um, it's not even just that the, the uh, project won't work. Um, it's that they'll look bad. They'll get the, that's one of the few things where if you buy these credits and you look bad, you get the John Oliver segment, it's much worse, right? Mm -hmm. And that just steers the risk reward back to something that everybody, you know, it's supposed to be old saying, you know, we got fired for buying IBM, yeah. right? So we do have to find some sort of mechanism where that risk actually is rewarded rather than, than beaten out of you. 
as an Indian born Australian, I love it when a, when an Englishman tells me what to do. It's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> me every time. Um, okay, so there's a bit of a theme. Does anyone else else have anything to add to that piece in terms of market demand? Just push back. I mean, I, I, we're focused on uh, regulated markets, specifically Europe. Um, we got 2025. We got. Um, uh, all European companies are required to report their footprint for the first time. Mm -hmm. We will have uh, country level targets for the first time for those companies. And then in addition, in 2026, we've got CBAM. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's our thesis is really built around yeah. that portfolio. Um, right now, I'd say, uh, you know, the buyers are waiting until they absolutely have to do it, which mm -hmm. I think is a great investment proposition for uh, for us yeah. to be holding credits in that point. Yeah, just squeeze them at the time. <laughs> well, why not? Dump it up to hold and squeeze them. Yeah, I'd just I'd, I'd like to add, um, you know, the way we think about it, obviously, you know, the last year or so, there's been sort of a cratering of trust, uh, particularly yeah. around the verifiers, right? So Vera, Gold. Gold, I, still, I think, is still uh, sort of clean hands. Uh, we think about uh, the way uh, that we approach our credits is that we're going to meet those standards and more and have the, the data to back it up. Not to say that we don't need a third party. I think they're really important to the ecosystem, but there is, you know, there is really, you know, some Swiss cheese in in, in the system right now. So we go above and beyond and, and really like rely on our data and, and open it up. Um, I think that's the, the best response that we can have right now in, in a market that's lacking trust. Yes. And, you know, we, I mean, Darren, you're doing the piece of legislation, whatever you want to call it. I think that's going to bring a lot more integrity. And we covered that yesterday in a separate panel. But, um, you know, things like the core carbon principles with the ICBCM and all that wonderful stuff um, are starting to take the steps in the right direction. And the data that underpins that's fantastic. So my question is, we're at this position, right, where we've, we've got the need. We know we need to decarbonise. We, we know we need to hyperdrive that. And there's the money sitting there, but there's no trust in the financial markets to put financing towards this. So what type of bridge financing structures exist? What type of bridge financing structures would you like to see that don't exist for these projects while we rebuild trust? Because we can't stall. We can't stall. Um, we can't stall. I, you know, I, I was thinking, I, was, I heard somebody talk a little bit about bonds and, and perhaps, Darren, you know, this, this legislation that you're putting out will create a lot of space, right? So the entire bond, bond market is something like $140 trillion. About a trillion of that is is green. Um, a lot of space to, to go. Um, I think that, you know, a carbon-backed economy built on bonds could get us to the next step while governments and, and private uh, private capital comes and, and fills in the space a little bit later. Um, you know, I think that gives a little bit of space. Obviously, you need some sort of uh, risk-based capital and some concessionary capital, nonprofit world. By the way. Um, um, but I think I think there's a lot of opportunity in the uh, in the green bond space or the carbon-backed bond space. Anyone else want to respond? Yeah, no, I, um, I can add. So one way to bridge and to bring more financing to, to these projects is to make uh, this market a more standardized uh, market. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that we need to see. Uh, say, traditional financial institutions, lending to project developers and willing to take on a risk or several risks, actually, because it's performance risk, non-delivery risk, reputation, regulatory risk. Um, so we, we we need to make sure there is uh, enough appetite from, from lenders um, and coming from the commodity space. Um, I think there is a lot of um, things that can be done. And we're we seeing the same um, mechanisms, uh, same players trying to bring value or, or money. For example, we have a lot of commodity traders that have been uh, putting a lot of money in projects, uh, NBS projects. Uh, why? Because they have a long-term view. They think that the credit, the prices will uh, appreciate over time. But also, that's part of their DNA to take risk. Partly because behind what they're doing, they go to financial institutions and they get refinanced they lay off the risk to bigger uh, bigger lenders. So mm. that's one way to look at it. The other way is, well, for end buyers. So typically um, a, um, a buyer of NBS credit would be a, a blue chip company, all right? 
um, investing in a project. So they have to be aware that there is a risk uh, that they may lose money, um, but they go beyond just the, I would say, carbon benefits to it. So for a blue chip company, investing in an NDS project is actually um, rewarding in several uh, aspects. One, you get the credits so you can offset whatever you couldn't reduce. But, and again, because we focus on NBS and on forest uh, preservation efforts, the impact is two or threefold. All right, so there's a carbon impact. There is the uh, impact on local communities because there is money that goes back to the, the people that are directly impacted and that are responsible for deforestation, for example. And the third uh, positive impact is the uh, natural habitats that are being restored. So it's a little bit philanthropic um, and, and it's a good PR also exercise for a blue chip company. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think the, the biggest opportunity is now is because I, I fully agree with Charles. We got to fix the markets. There's one theme out of today and yesterday. Markets are broken. We need to fix that. Unfortunately, it's going to take time. So what's going to bridge it? I mean, the problem is actually the answer is very simple. It's a small market at the moment, a couple of billion risk capital. The best opportunity to lock in your credits now from like high quality companies like sitting here who's got all the data, we can prove it. 10 years from now, we can still prove that everything was correct. Our MRV was correct. It was verified. This is the opportunity. I mean, think about it. $3 billion, that's nothing. Yeah. I mean, if someone could buy the whole market, buy it for $25, $30, <laughs> you'd be billionaire. It's like it's buying Bitcoin at a dollar. I mean, that's the opportunity we're looking at right now. And I think that's what's going to stop in. And that's what we're going to bridge for the next couple of years while we actually fix the markets with companies like Triangle will help do that. Just make sure you don't lose it all on the USB it, sticks. So. It's like buying at one dollar, knowing that prices by 2030, 2040 will go to one. What did he say? One fifty. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Because Bitcoin is about is it going to be something? But we know climate change is real, so it's going to be an issue. Yeah. So let me let me ask you another question. I, I don't want to create an us versus them type thing with these panelists here. <laughs> because they're separated right down the middle. Nature based, Good guys. Engineered based. Nature based, by definition, is harder to quantify. Engineered based, relatively easier to actually quantify because you're plugging methane holes. You know what's in the atmosphere. You know the impacts you're having. They're re they're, they're they're doing deep deforestation, all that wonderful stuff. We don't like it's, it's extremely hard to quantify. So, do you think it's easier to attract financing in this bridge position? for something that is easily quantifiable than not? And how much do you not like them for that? <laughs> in, a, in a very candid way, uh, I don't like to use that term, but the, the market is fragmented, so so are the buyers, I would say. Um, and you have to, to make it simple, two categories of buyers, the, the ones that want to have a direct impact on nature, all right, so they don't really care, they, they go beyond just carbon. And you have the other ones that are more I would say, um, you know, sensitive to infra or to tangible things or engineering uh, type of, of projects that they would be, I would say, uh, more attracted to buying those types of credits. I was going to say, I, I mean, I don't think we're competition at all. In fact, I think we help you guys. Uh, what we found out last year was that if the market was 90, I don't know, 8% in nature-based credits, that was setting it up for a fall. Mm -hmm. um, we have buyers who want nature-based credits. We have some nature-based credits. Uh, we have buyers who want credits. Mm -hmm. And I think having diversification is the best thing that can happen. Yep. Uh, plus, obviously, a great DMRV solution and repository, which is what Darren's building. <laughs> um, that, yeah, that, those two things together, I think, are going to be critical. Yeah. You know, I. I uh, we obviously need more, right? Like we're not going to get ourselves out of this whole thing with the current solutions on market, right? We need more options, more, more ideas. I do think about it just as an existential thought on a Wednesday afternoon. It's unclear to me that in a, a certain number of years we're actually going to want this level of MRV. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know this to be true, but you know, on one side it's like maybe it's priced such that it's between plus or minus fifty percent. Right. And that's we're OK with it because we're doing so much because we're going to be talking about gigatons. Right. Mm. Um, and on the other side of engineered solutions, like people are asking, like, all right, is it 0.5 grams? Is it like, like we don't actually care if we're talking about gigatons of removal. Right. right? Um, so I do think that 
we're in a very early part of a weird market question mark of how much MRV is the right amount. And when people ask, how much do I need to spend on MRV? What is the right amount? And I don't know the answer to that. It's very easy. We just crank it to, it goes to 11, right? And then we sell that because that is easy to, easier to sell in some ways. But it's not clear that that's actually the right answer. So it might be somewhere in the middle. You've just offended my head of assurance. I'm a part of <laughs> No, that's okay. Look, I could go on for days and you could go on for days, but we don't have days. We have about five minutes for questions from the audience. So uh, we know we're standing in your way between a drink and a little nibble. <laughs> You've got some questions, raise your hands, and uh, we'll get this esteemed panel to answer them for you. Do you have any questions? I've got one I'd like to ask that I didn't get to ask. Oh, awesome. Everyone's a drink. Last question. <laughs> the data piece underpins everything, right? Don't hate me, Darren. There's so many data plays out there that provide that level, or, or at least say they do. Right? What is the standardization that is required? How do we know which ones to trust? What should we look for in our baseline data and our data tools and capabilities within them to provide us with that verifiable data and quality data? What are we looking for? Just like literally five words or less from each of you. <laughs> So the standing uh, in the way of drinks, go. go. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the data platform we built, you know, is is about collecting the data. You know, that's that's very robust, and we have that. And we were doing business with those growers anyway, so we could just add them on to a project if they wanted to be on yeah. it, right? No, no, no need for financing and all those pieces. But the the last bit, the MRV, we we're on about our third version of because everybody wants different reporting and it, the, the, it keeps changing right so it's got to be flexible it can't be fixed it's you got you got to move with what what people are asking for and so that that mrv um uh, it, it's not a big part because we have all the rest but it's it's critical to to do that reporting and meet the needs of those who want to audit and connect to other systems to share that data yeah uh, quick quick uh, our data for example is is public data that we that we use so satellite uh, images and, and data um so we're not making up numbers then it's a question of is what do you do with that data mm -hmm. um and again we're not making up at the output we are following methodologies that are you know approved uh by scientists uh by governments you know so it's it's really making sure that we are providing uh, a kind of objective uh, set of data. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't think I have an answer, frankly. I mean, on Monday uh, was uh, with in a, at this thing called Region House, uh, where the uh, CEO of uh, Whole Foods was talking. Right, uh, same problem, different, yep. different uh, sector. Um, I don't think anybody's got the answer just yet, right? In terms of that sort of unity, that set of data that we yep. all know to be true. Um, so, uh, you know, what's my response? I think what I'm also hearing is, you know, collect it right? to the extent that it's it's practical and, and reasonably priced. And then we'll figure out there, you know, the standards will come along uh, eventually and to help us define what is right and good. I also don't think it's on this panel to provide the verification standard guidelines that yeah. need to be verified. Quickly, anything else that? No, I, I like just just tap into existing data that already exists. I mean, we, we, we took a lot of effort that everything that's required is already mandated by regulators, by uh, so that this data companies already have. Yeah. And it's even better if regulators are already checking it. So you don't have to believe me. I mean, trust the government to check it. That's a big question. <laughs> Five words. Five Five things. Things to Something it is better than nothing. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The more transparent and open in terms of just publishing everything and show and allowing people to go through and open source and ferret through. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to be the unlock. He yeah. loves the not for profit world, this yeah. guy. You do. You do. You do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think talk uh, uh, resources that, to so access free. Before <laughs> thank you. Before we hand over to Darren to close, I just want to give these esteemed gentlemen <laughs> Thank you.